for the invitation and thank you for for attending my talk. Good afternoon there. Good morning here. My name is Ivo Jimenez. I'm a research scientist at UC Santa Cruz and I'm a cross incubator fellow at the Center for Research in Open Source Software at UC Santa Cruz. And today I'm going to talk about native workflows in the context of uh, experimentation workflows, workflows that we would write when we're writing a paper, when we're writing tests for an application, in general, any sort of um, R&D-ish scenario, like, like, like the one that we work on in, when we work with issues of I.O. And, um, and I'm gonna unpack first this container native workflow word, and, and I'm gonna explain what are the practical uh, issues that arise when we work with container native workflows and how a tool that we've developed, which is a very lightweight container native workflow engine called Popper allows us to address these, these apparent issues. Um, so first of all, and for the sake of completeness, let's look at what a container and what the container technology is. Container uh, uh, technology is, um, it's a way for, it's a virtualization approach that allows us to virtualize the operating system. If you're familiar with uh, hardware virtualization, um, which, uh, which I'm showing here on the left, uh, the difference with containers is that you see on the right, we don't have that uh, operating system over an operating system uh, layer. So we basically are blowing up uh, the hypervisor layer and the OS layer. And thanks to some of uh, Linux's uh, namespaces and C groups features, we're able to provide an application with the illusion that that application has the entire operating system for itself, but it's actually sharing it with uh, other containers in the system. And that allows us to um, do interesting things. That then one of the main benefits, and I think it was mentioned in the previous discussion session, which is that you can bring your own environment to shared infrastructure um, scenarios. So uh, back in my undergrad years, I would, uh, have to deploy the LAMP stack, which is a, a, a very common stack for running like web pages, which is basically Linux, uh, yeah, Apache, MySQL, or Postgres, and is this traditional uh, web software stack. And it would take like a couple of, uh, of days or even like more than a week to set this up and have everything all configured and whatnot. And with uh, with Docker, which is one of the or, or the most famous uh, container um, application that you can easily install on your machine, it's just uh, one command that you run on your terminal. You say Docker run, and then you pull this image, uh, which somebody else prepared for us, and you have an entire LAMP stack running on your machine. Um, um, maybe something more. Uh, um, more in, in in line with the times is like there are other types of more complex software stacks like for example the in the machine learning um, um, in the machine learning world like uh, like software stacks that deal with uh, in, with deep uh, learning and being able to run on GPUs and having all the software well prepared and well and compiled for a particular platform so and in general we have all this uh we can leverage all this effort that people uh, besides us do and share uh, the docker hub which is one of the main repositories for images that container images there's uh, more than a hundred thousand what I say curated images, but there are actually millions of images that people share. Um, and there's also in, in HPC Singularity, which is another container engine that allows you to have access to these stacks uh, that uh, that allow you to save a lot of time with and uh, with to set up everything. So that's in general in in a few words 
the what containers are and what are the benefits of using containers. Uh, so now, what what do I mean by a container native paradigm? So in a, in a container native paradigm, what we uh, what we look at is that we apply or we use containers for everything, and from building the software to preparing an experiment to running the experiment to processing data to generating uh, manuscripts uh, like all these in end to end workflow we have uh, we can leverage containers uh, because then we can easily share those containers so other people can repeat what we've done so um, in, in another way of, uh, of looking at container paradigm is that if you on your machine you're installing software directly on your machine by 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 means of a package manager like AppGet or DNF or Homebrew, etc., uh, then you're not following the container native approach. Um, obviously, I'm excluding things like a web browser and an email reader and etc. Uh, but in all the the software we that is the main um, the main piece of software that, that we use to run our experiments and our uh, pipelines. That's what I mean. If you have to install, for example, a compiler, you have to install uh, a visualization library in, in, in directly in the system, then that's not following the container native pattern. Um, and so, again, container native pattern means using containers for everything. And when we follow this approach, and if we start using containers for everything that are some, it, we have the benefit of not having to install things, but there are other issues that come up. Um, and this, it, from my point of view, or for the purposes of this talk, there are three main issues that I'm going to talk about. There, there are more, but these are, I think, what, what are the main ones that at least people uh, have to deal with and get discouraged when they're starting to buy into this of paradigm. The first one is having to deal with all these multiple container images that you might find. So you find like, for example, you can use, uh, uh, I don't know, a compiler, and then, then you can use Py uh, Python, the SciPy stack, and then you can use uh, something else to generate your PDF, LaTeX, or whatnot. And then you start to, um, having to kind of defeat the purpose of containers because everything becomes manual again. You're dealing with multiple images, and multiple ways of instantiating containers out of those images. And we're back at this scenario where everything is unstructured and ad hoc and, 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 and now with the addition of having to use containers. The other one is that Depending on where you run, there are multiple container runtimes that are available to you, and I'm going to describe more about this later. The problem, but in general, there are many options for running containers, and each of these container engines uh, come with their particularities, and and having to deal to deal with each of those, it's kind of a, a pain. When what we only want to do is is run a software that has that has been prepackaged. The third one is that if you are running at, at scale or in on clusters, there's these clusters are managed by a resource manager or a scheduler. And each of these different schedulers that are out there have different ways of supporting containers. So then you need to be learning how to run containers on a very specific way for every different resource manager that you have to interact with, um, and again, this is this is this is um, this presents as a barrier to users of containers because um, they get discouraged because they they were able to run things before without containers. They were used to the workflows, and now they have to learn again how to do something. For example, in Swarm. So um, what uh, that's Kind of like the main problems that I, that I, uh, that we've seen based on 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 practical uh, scenarios that that people face, and what we came up with is this uh, uh, tool, which is a very lightweight container engine workflow engine, 
um, that is called Popper that allows you to kind of overcome these issues if you're if you're starting to uh, follow or work under the container native paradigm. So I'm gonna describe how we address each of these um, and how Popper is helping with these or these. So the first one is again we're we're looking for example at the paper um, on a on a scientific exploration someone else did, and if we follow the container native paradigms, then we would ideally produce something like you see on the right, which is an artifact description that tells you not only uh, uh, how to re re repeat the experiment, but if you're following the container native paradigm, then that means you prepare containers for your ex experiments, you sh you're sharing those containers, and then th that readme is looking like something like download this container, then run this command, then pull, then run this other container for pooling data, then run this other container. And as I mentioned, all these multi-container uh, workflow, it's error prone and you, it, as, as someone that follows these instructions, eventually you face issues. And then we're back on this scenario, having, having a hard time trying to reproduce results. So with Popper, what 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 you can do is we can you can express in the form of a very lightweight YAML file these steps. So rather than expressing those in a narrative form, you say, okay, this is what you do for step one. You run this container, you pass these arguments, and then that will create an output on the current folder that you're executing. Then you uh, next step is running the next step with a different container passing those arguments and so on and so forth. And that's very straightforward. It's machine readable. And it gives a, a very clear description of the order in which uh, uh, commands, container, nat container native commands should be executed. Uh, so Popper is, to mention, a lightweight container engine that takes these, these YAML files and re-executes them on, on your machine. So the only requirement is that you have a container uh, a container engine running on your machine like Docker. So you, you run Docker and that's it. The, that's all you need. Docker uh, Popper runs in Docker itself, so you don't have to install anything. You just install Docker or other engines. And I'm going to talk about other engines. And then you, from that point on, you can start consuming these workflows that other people have worked on. Um, so that's, uh, if, if we look back at this example, right, instead of having that readme on the right, where, where you're expressing in narrative form, you instead create a workflow. And given that it, this is JAML, then it would be hopefully easy to read. And at the same time, machine the 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 engine can execute it. Uh, and it is in this particular case, these are examples from the supercomputing uh, 2018 and 2019 student cluster competitions. They are codifying the reproducibility challenge part of the student cluster competitions, and these are available for people to play with, and and um, so that that they are they are easily re repeatable in other in other machines. And and know that you can, as part of your workflow, build the application that you're about to run. So you don't necessarily have to have a, an image with you with binaries pre-built. You can actually generate binaries as part of your implementation of your workflow. So that's the first uh the first issue of dealing with multi-container workflows and how do how does Popper help with that? The second one, the second issue, as I mentioned, is that when you start working with containers, you want we find that we have a container and ideally it's very easy to run. And if we're only running on our machine, then that's fine. Docker is very it's been um, it, um, iterated for quite a while now, it's very mature, but Docker for desktop uh, um, um, engine works very nicely on Windows, on Mac, and on Linux. And all that's good until you want to run on other systems um, that are not managed by you. And then you start 
seen issues of security, issues of um, of uh, privileges and whatnot, and people have uh, been developing alternative engines to run containers in this different scenarios that have different requirements. Uh, the problem from the user point of view is that that's, I, I really don't want to learn the particularities of each of these engines. I just want to take my workflow, which is just a list of containers that I worked on on my machine and being able to run those as is on this different, on this different environments. So what Popper helps with is actually create that abstraction layer and you just need to focus on your workflow, the logic of your workflow, make it work on Docker. And all these engines are able to translate between Docker to their own formats and their own particular ways of working. So Popper is actually doing that transparently. Take that workflow and you say, okay, I'm gonna run it uh, by default. Or if you say, if you're in your machine, you say Popper run, and this is gonna run it on your local machine using Docker, it assumes Docker. But you, you can say, okay, I'm not, don't use Docker, use Botman. And then under the covers is gonna be doing all the, all the, all the required, um, all, all that it takes in order to take that same workflow with those same images that you've uh, prepared and run them on a different engine. Uh, right now we support Podman, but we're working on Singularity and Docker, uh, and and we are we welcome pull requests for others. Um, so that's another. So that's another the step. The second point. The third point is kind of like the same as with container runtimes, but at the level of resource uh, managers. So if, if, if you work with containers and then you want to start experimenting or you're running on other scenarios and other in clusters that are managed by these resource managers, then we find that, again, there's all different ways in which we can run this workflows. Um, each each uh, resource manager comes with its own particularity and so on. So in this case, Popper is also doing that same job of abstracting between your workflow and the logic of your workflow and how it runs, maybe on your machine, and and then running on these platforms. You can we can say, okay, I now I'm going to run on Slurm, and then Popper will take care of uh, setting the launching the jobs using the the, the batch manager. The, the commands allow the commands available for Slurm for in Slurm to launch jobs, and it will take care of properly launching those because there are different ways. For example, if you're working with NPI, there's a there's a way in which you have to run these commands, underlying commands, so that you can actually leverage the native NPI implementations of your of your um, of your cluster. Um, that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, the takeaway is this container native paradigm improves reproducibility aspects um, of experimentation workflows. Uh, but uh, as anything, there's no free launch. Working in this in this new paradigm uh, comes with its own issues and. With uh, Popper, we try to address those in a holistic and user-friendly way. Um, and and before I I stop, let me mention briefly uh, the journal of high performance storage. Um, that it's a new effort that it's uh, led by Julian and and Jay, and and the the idea for this journal maybe we can discuss. Uh, more on our on the discussion session, but the idea is to come up with a new journal that it's fully open uh, online. That it's a that has a, a nice chip herding approach to take uh, in new submissions with, and through an incubation process of papers. And one of the things we have been trying to do is have Popper not 
as a requirement, but just present it as an alternative to authors so that they so that these can minimize the overhead in in the pre-review process for for submissions because it's in validating the or or checking the reproducibility aspects of a paper it's a lot of work and i've been involved in in in, in committees like the artifact review of supercomputing and sosp and other uh, conferences and it's it's really a lot of work and using this container native workflow and using um, um, engines or formats like like popper really has a low overhead on the reviewer side and that also means that it will also be the case for the reader side so people reading your paper will have an uh a friendlier experience when consuming your research, which in turn will translate and has been proven in higher citations for your work. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. Thanks.